the role of a lifetime. Will Graham plays his famous grandfather, Billy Graham, on the big screen. Plus, emotionally abused by his father, a man's self-image leads to self-destruction. Always in my mind, thinking that I was stupid and I wouldn't ever amount to anything, it would always self-destruct. Find out where he found his true identity on today's 700 Club Interactive. Hi, and welcome to the show. We've got a great program for you today, including Will Graham playing the role of his life, that of his famous grandfather, Billy Graham. Well, you don't want to miss that. But up first, we would like to share this story of God's faithfulness. Casey's pregnancy went off without a hitch, but after her son's birth, something went wrong. Baby Hunter kept spitting up, and soon his very life was in jeopardy. He couldn't hold anything down from the first time we tried to feed him. Hunter Chezer was only two days old when his parents, Jake and Casey, noticed a problem. He could only eat about a half ounce of formula at a time instead of the normal two ounces. Um, any more than that and he would spit everything back up or um, any pressure on his stomach um, would make him spit back up. Hunter's doctor ordered x-rays. There's a just a, a mass that took up about two thirds of his stomach. They actually showed us where it was and you could feel it. And so, and that was, that was probably the most heartbreaking part of it is actually being able to feel the mass in his stomach that's, that's not letting me eat. The doctors told them it was life-threatening and he needed to be treated immediately. He said, um, Hunter cannot live with this mass and we need to send him to Denver to, to take it out because he can't eat enough to live with it. I remember both my wife and I were just very scared, very worried. I was blown away. I didn't know what to think. I didn't know what to say. I just, you don't expect to see that in your baby that's two days old. Hunter was airlifted to the Rocky Mountain Hospital for Children in Denver, five and a half hours away. Jake and Casey called for prayer, and from there, it spread. My brother, Morgan, got on Facebook and put this prayer request out on Facebook. And within hours, he had people all over the country and all over the world. He had friends in Australia and New Zealand and England. Um, all his friends and their churches were praying for Hunter. The circle of prayers within hours was overwhelming. Jake's mother, Norleen, called CBN's prayer center. I couldn't find the words myself to pray. It was just that feeling of needing somebody that, since I couldn't put it into words that I knew at the other end of that phone line could. And, and she did, and that's what I needed. Jake remembers the long drive to Denver. Yeah, I was just incredibly worried, and I, I think I spent most of the trip praying for Hunter. In Denver, doctors conducted tests, and a 3D ultrasound confirmed the results. The best prognosis we were looking at was him leaving in two months, but we should probably plan for him to be there at least six months. The evening before Hunter's surgery, Casey was feeding her son. I was in the room by myself and I fed Hunter and he drank the whole two ounce bottle. And, and he was perfectly fine. At that time, I, I was cautiously optimistic because I didn't want to get my hopes up, but something changed. The next morning, doctors ordered another MRI to get a last look before surgery. A while later, the doctor came in and she had a strange look on her face, which scared me to death. It's like something happened, you know, and it probably is not good. But she came in and, and she said, okay, I have news for you. She said, um, we just got done with the MRI and I don't know what they saw, but it's not there now. Medical records confirm the mass doctors detected on the 12th was gone the next day. They couldn't explain it and they didn't really attempt to explain it. I just, I knew he'd been healed. I, I knew the Lord healed him. And yeah. I remember looking at Casey and I mean, we just broke down and both started crying. Today, Hunter is a busy, healthy toddler. Jake and Casey are grateful for his healing and the power of prayer. There were thousands of people praying for Hunter and every single one of those prayers mattered. 
it's the kind of relationship the Lord wants with us, is we can ask Him anything, come boldly before the throne of God. Praying expectantly, stretched out Italy, that little boy was touched by the hand of God. I couldn't help but think of my son watching that because I know what it's like to have a child rushed off within 24 or mm -hmm. 48 hours after being born to a children's hospital. Wow. And fortunately, a week later, my son was released. I also learned in the pain and concern for your child's life of knowing in that time it is possible to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. During the scariest times, God can reveal himself. And Terry and I now want to take the time to pray for you. Whatever you're going through, the miracle you may need, the fear you may be experiencing, we saw from that story there is power and community prayer. Amen. And Terry and I are going to join hands and pray for you now. Heavenly Father, we rejoice in seeing that story and the miracle that unfolded, Lord, and now we think of the audience and their concerns. And Father God, first we want to cast out fear for those who have received a diagnosis that is frightening. You tell us be anxious for nothing. You say fear not, to be courageous, that the peace you give surpasses understanding. It's not like the world gives. Do not be troubled or afraid. Father God, we rebuke fear now in the name of Jesus. There's someone, you have a constriction in your throat. It kind of comes and goes, actually, but when you have it, you, you can hardly swallow. God is healing that condition for you. You're simply not going to feel it again. It's gone in Jesus' name. There's great heartache and heartbrokenness, broken hearts because of rejection. Mm. And Jesus just says to us now, I don't love the way the world loves. I don't reject you. That we are part of God's family, a love so deep, so sincere, so true, that Christ would die on a cross for our redemption. Do not believe the lies of the enemy when our enemy tells us we are valueless. Christ, we thank you for your sacrifice. God, we thank you for your love. Holy Spirit, we thank you, the counselor, the spirit of truth that ministers love to us today in Jesus' name. Someone else, you have a child that's been diagnosed with skeletal issues and uh, there's still, uh, the, the, the diagnosis is still not absolutely firm. God's healing your baby right now, and you're not going to have any problems with the growth of this child, with the health and well-being of this child. All is well in Jesus' name. And there is a father who's, there's a husband whose wife is delivering a baby, and he has just received very, very frightening news about the condition of labor. And the Holy Spirit of God just says, do not fear, I will intervene in the name of Jesus with a healthy baby and your wife will be okay. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the work of your son Jesus on the cross. We thank you for redemption for our sin, for loving us when we are unlovable, for loving us when we are fearful, for your patience with us as you call us to obedience. And Holy Spirit, we pray you will continue to lead us and light our path. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. I want to remind you, you can always call us for prayer, 800-700-7000. We would love to pray for you at any time. Well, up next, an exciting sequel to American hero Louis Zamperini's story. It's in theaters this month, but we've got one of the stars with us in studio today. Hear from Will Graham right after this. Incredible story. Joining us now is the man who plays Billy Graham, his real life grandson, Will Graham. Welcome, Will. Oh, thank you so much. Good to have you here. I'm sure you're asked all the time, but being Billy Graham's grandson, I mean, you must have some amazing memories of time with him. I do. And uh, I've, I've seen it from a perspective that most people never get to see. Um, I call him Daddy Bill. That's what we call him. Uh, as a grandchild, that's what we call him. And uh, we've got some great special memories that uh, we've had with my granddaddy over the years and thankful for him, that's for sure. And we'll see him again, even though we've yeah. 
lost him here on this earth. We, we know where he is. He's up in heaven, and I'm going to see him again one day. I mentioned to you very briefly before the program that I have a special interest in this film because I got to interview and meet Louis Zamperini in 2003, I believe, and he told us his incredible story. What an amazing man. And you guys have picked up the story really where it gets interesting here, uh, the redemptive part of his story. But before the film, did you know much about your grandfather's relationship with Louis Zamperini? Oh, yeah, yeah. He's, a, now he's a name that we knew fairly well. I didn't know much about him. I didn't really know the movie. I mean, I didn't really know about Louis all that well until the book came out in 2010. And so my wife read the book and she said, man, this, this guy's life's incredible. I was like, uh-huh, whatever. So I picked <laughs> it up and started reading it. And it was, in, I, I couldn't put the book story. down. And I hate to read him. And I love this story. Now, I just want to be clear. This is not a movie that the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association has done. Uh, his life story is, uh, is owned by Universal. So this is a Universal movie. Uh, that's done by them. I just got to play in the part with uh, with all the other actors. Most of us have seen Unbroken. So where does this film pick up? Yeah, the the, the film, this part, uh, really it picks off right off where the last one uh, ended. That's when he came home, gave his mom and dad a hug. Um, that's in the timeline. That's yeah. when this one will start. Now, to be fair, this is a it's an incredible movie. And it picks off, but you don't have to see the first right. movie to understand the second part. Well, and for those of us who've read the book or seen uh, Unbroken, we may think at the end, happy ending, great, he's home. But really, that's where some real terror starts for Louis. It, it is, and that's when the wheels start falling off. Uh, he was suffering from PTSD. He was struggling with that. He became an alcoholic due to that because he was having nightmares. And he was trying to get good nights of sleep, but he couldn't because of the nightmares of the torch that he uh, that took place while he was a prisoner of war. And so that's what he was struggling with. His marriage started to fall apart. Um, he was desperately trying to figure out a way to fix himself, but he didn't know what to do. And it wasn't until that his wife came to know Christ that uh, gave him hope. Yeah, and it would be natural for anyone to have trouble coping, right? I mean, plane crash in a raft for 47 days yeah. or so, then extreme torture, finally gets home. He met a special woman who really played a key role in his life. Tell us about her. Boy, Cynthia, that, that, she was, I never got to meet either one of them, but Cynthia is uh, someone that I would love to meet when I get to heaven. I mean, she really did. She's the one that stuck through the movie. Um, you know, through the movie, you see she sticks with her husband the whole time. And they had a great love relationship. And, this, and the story that you see in this movie is a really a love story between a husband and wife. Like many marriages, they struggled, but they found a way to go through it by giving their life over to Jesus Christ. I remember him telling me, he said, Andrew, I was struggling when I came home, and I remembered the promises I made to God. I said, if you'll get me out of this raft and let me survive, if you'll get me out of these prison camps, I will serve you forever. And he said, I realized when I got home, I didn't keep that promise. But what happened regarding your grandfather that changed the trajectory of Louis' well, life? Well, he went to these meetings reluctantly. He, he was skeptic about God. He didn't like preachers. He went because his wife asked him. His wife decided not to divorce him, and that touched his heart. It really did, didn't it? And yeah. that softened him. He was not a very good husband, he would say. No, he wasn't. And he realized he was the problem. He had a perfect wife, yeah. but he was the problem in the marriage because he was a drunk. Hmm. So when he went to these things, he got up. He made an agreement. He said, honey, if uh, we go to these things, as soon as it comes to the invitation, we're out. And that's what happened. He shook his hand <laughs> at my granddad and walked out the back. He knew what was coming at that event. Yeah, that's right. And But then the second night, he got up to leave because he was mad. He felt like Billy Graham was preaching at him, and he got to the end of the row, and when he went to turn, go out the back, he said his feet took him to the front. He doesn't remember how he got to the front, and next thing you know, he's given his life over to Christ, and his life was never the same. Holy Spirit got a hold of him. And, That's right. And he said from that point on, he never had another nightmare. That's right. Never had another drink. However, there's still that huge issue of the torture and the beatings he received from the bird, the Japanese yeah. guard. and. Amazing story of forgiveness. What happened? It is, you're, you're exactly right. Here's a man, as soon as he gives his life over to Christ in 1949, listening to my grand, October 16th, 1949, he gives his life to Christ. His life was immediately changed. One, like you said, he, he got to sleep through the night and never had another nightmare. Uh, his drink had done. Incredible. Never had I mean, the power of God to change right your life. Then. But the problem was still going on was forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And when he came and met his captors, Back in Japan, at the same prison that he was held, now he's he's going in to meet them as the captors. He goes in to meet with them, and he said, this is going to be the test if to know what God really did was to change my heart or was this all emotion. And when he said he saw his former captors for the first time, his heart melted, and he realized what God did the year before in 1949 
had, was truly a heart transplant in Louis. His life had been, his, he had been forgiven, and he knew that now he could able to forgive them, and he could. That really set him free, it ultimately. And, and so many of us struggle with forgiveness. How important is that in the Ooh. life of a believer? Well, that's, if there's one cancer in the Christian society today, it's, it's, it's unforgiveness, when we're willing to unforgive. Mm. And what, this is something my grandmother taught me. Uh, she said, a good marriage is made up of two quick forgivers. <laughs> and you got to be willing to forgive one another. And that's what makes a marriage work. But even, but today we get mad at people. We'll yeah. say, we'll get back with them. And I see a lot of tragedies on television. Um, you see a lot of people get hurt. Some people you say, we forgive the person that hurt, you know, hurt my husband or hurt my wife. And then you see others saying, oh, I hope they, you know, they, you know, I hope they rot in hell or something like that. And they say something out of their heart and they're mad. And they're dealing with unforgiveness. And right Louis there. had the right to say that about those men he torturing did. him. He had every right, but it was killing him on the inside. And that's what it is. That's why I called it cancer, because it was destroying Louis. You know, Louis mm -hmm. was trying to, he thought this is the best way to get back is to hate them. But it was destroying him and destroying his marriage, destroying his family. And when he able to give all that up, his life was changed. Incredible life. It is. Incredible story. You can see Unbroken Path to Redemption in theaters on September 14th. Check your local listings for time and locations. Will Graham, thanks for being with us. Uh, thank you so much. Congrats on your acting debut. You said it may be the last time, though? It might, probably will no. be. All right. Well, let's go over to Terry. Well, coming up, a former addict returns to the streets he once called home. See the inspiring reason why he went back. To the homeless in and around California's Redwood City, David Sheeran says someone is coming to help. David is the man behind Street Life Ministries, and because of him, a countless number of people have conquered their addictions and found safe shelters. There's a reason why David has a heart for the homeless, because not too long ago, he was among them. I'd go to the bar, who's gonna buy all the drinks? Right, you know, I want you to like me, so I'm buying everybody around, you know? And somebody would lay out some cocaine, and you know, he would do a line, oh, I could do something bigger than that. Just impress. You know, to the point of going to the hospital, getting sick, you know, overdosing, you know, and stuff like that. Dave Sheeran would do most anything to get people to like him. He didn't much like himself because of the way his dad treated him as a kid. My dad's alcoholism was becoming a lot stronger. Um, his, his, you know, he was taking prescription medication, smoking a lot of weed. He was really quick to tell me that I was stupid that, you know, that, that'll never work, you know, you're, you're an idiot, you know, or that's, that's gay. It really started to hurt me, you know, uh, emotionally. Like, why is, like, why is he yelling at me? Like, why am I not, you know, um, being loved? To compensate, he played the class clown. I wanted to be liked. I wanted my dad to like me. I wanted the kids at school to like me. I wanted the teachers to like me, but I wasn't getting it. And so I found out that if I made people laugh in class, I thought they liked me. As a teenager, Dave became promiscuous and stole pot from his dad to share with friends. It was just this hole that I kept trying to fill. Instead of just having you like me for who I am, I, I would always come with stuff. Big bag of weed, you know, the house with the swimming pool, the mom and dad not being home, so hey, let's go to my house. Like, I don't know who I am. I don't have my, I have no identity. In his 20s, Dave worked hard as a truck driver, but his personal life was a wreck. He destroyed his two marriages through infidelity and drug and alcohol abuse. Always in my mind, thinking that I was stupid and I wouldn't have never amount to anything, it would always self-destruct. I didn't know what a man was. I didn't know what a husband was. I didn't know what being a father was. He was arrested and charged several times on drug charges over the years. By his mid-30s, he had quit his job and was homeless. I had been at the bottom for a little while, eating out of garbage cans. My mom and dad had put me in a program uh, up where they live, up north, and that was supposed to be like, it was gonna fix me. And I got kicked out within three days. Then at age 35, Dave was arrested after stealing a car at gunpoint. Instead of jail time, the judge sent him to a Salvation Army drug program that put the focus on God. The thought of God really, really upset me because um, everybody called God Father. And, and I was like, ah, you know, I don't, need, I don't need another father, right? I don't need to be condemned. I don't want to be judged. At one point, Dave inadvertently broke a rule that could have gotten him kicked out. 
Hoping for a sympathetic ear, he went to the chaplain. And he started praying um, over me and he started to uh, talk about breaking off generational curses, strongholds of addiction. And next thing I know, uh, I just, I got so hot. And I started sweating. And, and he says, do you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And I'm like screaming, yes, I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And, and I was surrendering. I was at my bottom and accepting Jesus Christ as, as my Savior from that point forward. Dave stayed in the program and says his addictions just fell away. He grew in his faith by reading the Bible and being mentored. As soon as I accepted Jesus Christ, it was amazing how God put so many people around me that just started to pour into me, like really solid Christian men and women that just, just started to really help me a lot. So that's when I started realizing that Christ has forgiven me. He says he doesn't have to seek approval from others anymore. To have friends today that don't want anything from me other than just being a friend it is unbelievable. And Dave was able to make things right with his dad before he died. I forgave him for the stuff that he had done to me in my life that I was angry for, but then all the stuff that I put on him that really didn't deserve to go on him, I was able to forgive him and myself for that, you know, and he was able to forgive me. For the first time in my entire life, my dad put his arms around me and he told me he was proud of me. And um, that <laughs> meant a lot to me. You know, to finally get that, you know, I, you know, I care about you and I love you and, uh, and, uh, and I'm, and I'm, I'm proud of you. Dave plugged into a church with a ministry to the homeless and is now the program's director. I'm absolutely amazed at the things that God is doing right now. Reaching out to help others find healing in God means everything to him. And he now works with police to find and help those in need on the streets. Dave is also married to Sean. Together they're raising their son Isaiah and sharing the truth that's changed him forever. Christ really truly loves me. Such an amazing story, so reflective of who every single one of us are. We are lost and broken and in need of a Savior, and that is why Jesus came. We are sinners, and we are constantly looking for a way to cover that, to fill us, to make us feel whole, to make us not face the need that's in us. And then one day something happens where someone brings us to the foot of the cross. And there's Jesus waiting, always, always waiting so patiently for you and for me. The other aspect of this story that is so true about the God that we love and serve is how he took the brokenness of Dave's past and he made something beautiful out of it. Dave's ministering wholeness and hope and love and forgiveness to people today that he wouldn't have had a message for if he hadn't first come to Christ. Listen, if you're searching in your life today, it doesn't matter where you've been, what's been done to you, where you're stuck at, surrender. That's the message here, surrender, just like Dave did. Come to that place of saying, God, I am at the end of myself. I'm tired of the pain. I'm tired of the guilt. I'm tired of the shame. I'm tired of being empty. Jesus said he came that you might have life and have it abundantly. Let him fulfill that promise in you by surrendering to him and receiving everything he has that he wants to give you. He loves you so much. If you'd like someone to pray with you today, our number's toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. Feel free to call now. Andrew? Terry, Dave's story just wow. so amazing. We've seen it countless times how God can change a life. Like you said, when there is surrender, he had so much pain in his heart, yeah. so Let much rejection. And That's just, what... what what our, our guest was talking about. Will, yes, Will was talking about today. Be free. Jesus can really radically change us. Absolutely. Amazing. We leave you with 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We'll see you next time.